we depend so much on that service. Yeah. Uh, you know, the clean water, fresh water. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Desalination is not going to save us. You know. Um, yeah. It, you know, that's the great gamble of our generation, the living generations today. Is we're starting to think that okay, technology is going to save us. Uh, we're going to get all the carbon out using machines, and that's that's not the case. Um, we we it's it's nature's going to do that, and um, one of our biggest opportunities to to do that is Africa Got on it. scale. It's Adam Vaughan here. I'm the Times' environment editor, and I'm lucky enough to be in Victoria Falls with Steve Boys. Um, Steve, could you just introduce yourself, please? Ah, thank you, Adam. Great to be here. And you can hear the falls behind us. Um, I'm Steve Boys. I'm the leader of the Great Spine of Africa series of expeditions. And uh, we're here uh, training new teams for um, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Great. Uh, and Steve, just a sort of really ridiculously big question to start off with, uh -huh. to sort of set the scene. I just wanted to just talk a little bit about the changes you've seen in, just give a little bit of an introduction to the changes you've seen in Africa's environment. I'm thinking, you know, everything from climate change to land use. I mean, that's like an impossibly big question, but just to sort of set the scene, maybe give a flavor of some of the changes you've seen in your lifetime. I mean, in Africa, we are facing a population and demographic time bomb. Over the next 25 years, we're gonna see the population double and water is crucial to that. Now, we've been exploring the rivers of Southern Africa for the last 15 years. And we've found that the upper reaches of these river systems, the sources most certainly, um, they're, they're scientifically unsurveyed. Um, the people living uh, at those locations are typically the least served in these countries. And um, the, the service they provide is, is valuable. Their, their business has been clean air and clean water for millennia. Mm. And um, downstream, we, we are seeing you know, issues with pollution, um, the eutrophication of water bodies. Mm. Um, our future is not secure. Our water security is not secure. Uh, food security is not secure. Um, we are seeing flash flooding. Um, we are seeing the displacement of large populations of people because of water. Mm. And um, we're really the only scientific group that focuses on establishing these detailed scientific baselines, mm. ecological and hydrological baselines for these river systems. Because uh, one of the biggest problems in the past was shifting baselines. So, I mean, um, in Africa, you know, we, we lose an elephant every 15 minutes. You know, we, we, we're looking at a rhino every six hours. Um, the megafauna are heavily threatened. Mm. Uh, elephants never go more than 40 kilometers away from water. They're tied to water, same as we are as people. Yeah. Um, so the, the biggest problem I see that Africa faces is water into the future. On the water thing, can we, can we say anything as crude? Are there any, can we say anything as crude as there's like a sort of trend in terms of a drying or, I mean, I know it's, it's obviously talking about a, a huge place here that's not homogenous, but is there anything as clear? As we're seeing it around the world. Yeah. Um, we, we, we're seeing um, more significant um, El Nino phenomena. Mm. Um, are the dry periods are drier, um, the wet periods are wetter. Mm. Um, certainly these river systems um, are becoming more and more dependent on rainfall in the tropical areas towards mm. the Congo Basin. So it's absolutely crucial that we start to explore those water sources, make sure that they are secured so that these lower river systems, the Zambezi, the Okavango, the Kwandu, can remain running and flowing mm. uh, as they are. But uh, climate change is a very big thing for Africa. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to come on to the headwaters and so on in a, in a, in a minute. But um, just, Thank you. just want to talk a bit, little bit about um, your motivation, Steve. Um, where does your sort of, where's your passion for conservation come from? I'm a sixth generation African um, and I've never thought of anything else other than becoming a, a game ranger or a conservationist uh, my, my whole life. Um, I could have done anything at university uh, and I finished school early, um, went into forestry. It was the highest nature conservation degree I could do at the time. Mm and uh, just followed that path ever since. I mean, it's it's uh, 
my family, my father's an engineer, my mother, aromatherapist, is, they're not conservationists, mm. uh, but they, they loved the bush and took us out. You know, there wasn't a two week period we weren't going somewhere, you know, yeah. and that was the reason I ate my peas and uh, finished my dinner because the threat was we won't take you next week to the Kruger National Park or to yeah. Botswana or wherever it was. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've always been like this. I've always wanted to be on expedition. Um, I remember when the National Geographic magazine used to have those pull-out maps, uh, turn those maps, me and my brother, into an unexplored landscape in our garden, and we would go exploring. And yeah. it was, it's always been exploring, yeah, go yeah, explore. Yeah. yeah. What's your sort of, did you have a kind of South African kind of childhood memory kind of equivalent of like, me catching sticklebacks or things back, you know, back in England. What was the was there a kind of like what was your interest in wildlife like as a kid? I suppose the the, the one that concerned my mother the most was um, after about a week in the Kruger National Park, but we were in one place. Mm. Um, myself and my brother had become integrated into a troop of baboons, mm. but now we are, you know, we're feeding and 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 just getting very very close to these animals. They are. A wild baboons they're not like these ones that are trying to steal your lunch yeah and um we would go following them and we'd end up far off in the bush with these baboons just uh, they were kind of watching out for us mm. um, my mother didn't think so but i remember that deep feeling of connection um not making eye contact um not you know focusing on any of the animals around you're just doing your own thing but being aware of them and it was just this wonderful i'm wild feeling this first connection with like our own innate wildness. Mm. That's really interesting. I might, I might want to come back to that a bit later on. And um, do, do you remember sort of the, what was your what was the first? What was the, can you remember as far back as your first expedition? And what was it? First expedition, expedition, um, like we do now on the Makoros. I mean, I, I, I um, sort of twenty years ago started my PhD uh, research in the Okavango Delta. I was a camp manager. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I was, I was just about to finish my master's. Mm. And a friend of mine told me about the Okavango Delta. I hadn't been there yet. It was the one place I hadn't gone. Yeah. And we went up there for New Year's. And I came back. And I still had six months to finish on the master's. And I told my professor, I said, I'm leaving. Uh, I'm going to the Okavango. And I got a job as head of housekeeping. And uh, finished the masters using Bushmail, which is almost like a HF-based Morse code, you know, for mm -hmm. for text. Mm -hmm. I got the masters. Then within a month or two, I started a PhD there. And uh, I remember going out, and I was just now, my whole world has become the Delta, uh, the Okavango Delta. I couldn't think of anything else. I couldn't imagine a world outside. And I got on a boat, and I was exploring the channels. Uh, I got lost, and I saw something in the water, and it was a makoro one of these dugout canoes. And I managed to get it out, and pulled it out, got the water out of it, put it on land, and then I wondered who, who it was. So I camped there, and then the next day took that makoro back. Mm. And I still have that makoro. Mm. It is still the makoro I use for all of our expeditions, 12,000 mm. kilometers of exploration in this makoro. But um, from that day, I would pull myself back to my house uh, from you know the lodge. Mm. And uh, those were my first kind of expeditions, uh, yeah. my first interactions with hippos, uh, the first mm. time a crocodile smashes into the side of your boat and, and all of that. Um, I mean, just a lot of people will have heard of the Okavango Delta, but maybe can't picture it. Can you sort of paint a bit of a picture for them? The Okavango Delta is a, it's an oasis in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. It's not an oasis, it's really an alluvial fan. Mm. So, I mean, it looks like my hand, picture your hand, mm. uh, going out many channels, mm. uh, over 10,000 islands, lagoons, um, uh, massive lagoons covered in lily pads, mm. um, the largest population of elephant in the world, 80,000 elephants, um, uh, largest population of lions equal to the Serengeti. Uh, there's just abundance of life. Mm. It is... Um, it's my spiritual home. It is, it is a true paradise on earth, um, primordial. Uh, to me, it's um, kind of a, like a, a little peek into prehistory, a time mm. before us, um, an incredibly special place uh, to protect. And, and, and just um, following on from that, I, may, I know you've worked on, sort of you, as you look back at the sweep of your career, um, what, it's probably hard to pinpoint one, but what, what's the sort of, project or experience that you're 
most proud of? What's the sort of to date, you know, obviously far from done, but what to date, what's the sort of thing that you would single out? It was in 2015. Um, it had taken us, you know, six months of looking at satellite imagery to try and figure out how to get to the source of the Okavango in the Angolan Highlands. Now, everyone thought that this was completely impossible. It is too dangerous. It's the most dangerous part of Angola. The largest landmines and landmine fields in Africa are there. And we partnered with the Halo Trust, mm. uh, humanitarian landmine clearance uh, NGO. And we tried a southern route. It was impossible. We tried a northern route. Uh, it was uh, eventually we got the trucks through. And uh, that was with Halo, without me. And they sent me a photograph, a grainy photograph from an old smartphone uh, of what looked like a wetland. And looking in the satellite imagery and reading and speaking to all of the experts and hydrologists for the region, they said, no, there are wetlands up there. Those are the sources of these rivers. But they didn't really know much about it. And um, about a month later, we are now, it took me it was five days to drive around and you bashing through this forest. There are no roads. It's cut marks and trees that we're following. We go through two minefields. Uh, that's, you've got the armored vehicles in front and we're going very slowly. And it was, it's, you know, at sunset, you break through the trees, look down into this valley, and there's this lake, the Quito source lake. It's not a wetland. It's this crystal clear lake and surrounded by giant peatlands. And uh, that, that was um, not just surprising, it fundamentally changed our understanding of the system, of those sources. Uh, we were so. A wetland dambo based system uh, is you know, filled by seasonal rain. Uh, this is a peatland-based system. We were to find, uh, an <laughs> we were to find 19 source lakes. Uh, these ended up being the sources for the Kwando, the Okavango, the Zambezi, the Congo, the Kwanza, this one place. Yeah. And that really started at the Quito source lake, that realization now that all these other lakes that we've seen there, um, all these wetlands were actually lakes. Um, that is, the peatlands themselves have massive water storage capacity. Yeah. Um, the, we realized that the Quito source lake and those peatlands, that represents long-term resilience to the impacts of climate change. And that is incredibly important. We found the lifeline for the mm. Okavango there, mm. uh, knowing that the, the sister river, the Kubangu to the west, is rocky-based, it's flash flooding, it results in the flood in the delta. It's fundamentally important to the delta, but it's not the lifeline. The Quito won't stop flowing. The mm. Quito has this capacity to hold water and store yeah. it. Well, that, that sort of brings us neatly to you. My next question which is obviously, you know, you talked at the outset about Africa's growing population and about water supply. Um, just, um, you know, you, you've, obviously a lot of your work has focused on, 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 on rivers, but obviously where that water comes from. Uh, um, yes. And so just, 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 uh, just tell me a little bit about where you're focusing on right now in terms of, so, you know, water sources. I mean, our focus is, what we, what I was talking about in 2015. I yeah. mean, that is what we call a water tower. Now, yeah. for those listening, a water tower in this context is not a wooden structure on top of a building in New York. This is a large-scale watershed. It is elevated. It is high rainfall. It's forested and has high water storage capacity because of peatlands. Now... Um, that water tower, fundamental to what we call the Kavangu Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. And that's the largest such conservation area in the world. It is home to more than two thirds of Africa's remaining elephants, uh, millions of people downstream. And that's a, this water tower that we didn't, you know, we documented for the first time. We've written all of the scientific papers on it. We've identified its importance. Mm. But when we profiled it, we started looking around the divides between the river basins. So now up in this Angolan water tower, we call it the Okavango Zambezi water tower. You have the uh, Okavango Zambezi divide. That's where the two basins meet each other. You have the Okavango Kwanza divide. You have the Zambezi Congo divide. So you can imagine 
a on this landscape a massive rain of thunder cloud comes over it rains that water can fall into the kwanzaa and go to the atlantic it can fall into the zambezi and go into the indian ocean it can fall into the congo and go for, go off north into that massive river system uh, that's the divides and now when we follow those divides around the congo following the congo zambezi divide you start to see areas that rise above 1100 meters in altitude up to 1400 500 and that's where you find a mist belt, and that's where you find the formation of peat. Mm -hmm. Now, we had a team go out to Upemba, and they found that we're looking at a small little water tower here. This, the, the one in Angola is 250 miles across. Mm. These other ones are, you know, 30 miles, 60 miles, 80 miles across. But there's an archipelago of these water towers going up Africa mm. that are not recognized for their importance. Yeah. Um, peatlands are not known in tropical Africa. Uh, yeah. The first discovery was in 2012. We've made the second largest discovery. Um, the Ramsar site that will be established around these source lakes will be equivalent to the third largest in the world. I know, I know what Ramsar is because this is my world, but explain to people what Ramsar is. Ramsar uh, is an international treaty, um, one of the most signed in the world, uh, that identifies a wetland as internationally important. Great. And it's, it's funny, isn't it? Because I, I, you don't think of, I know, be, uh, being from Britain, I'm sort of familiar with peatland, but you don't really think of peatland when you think of Africa, do you? So, so, well, I, 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 I'm an African and, and yeah. neither do I. I, th I thought it was used to make whiskey uh, yeah. in Scotland. Exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it, it was incredibly surprising. We, we took, we stand up pole on our Makoros in the Delta. Mm. We took one of those poles, it's called an Nkashi. And we started forcing it down into the into the ground, pulled it out, and that was when we realized this is peat. We have since cored it and looked at its age and started yeah. to look at um, the different strata and fire frequencies and all the fun things you can do with peat uh, historically. But um, sure. very, very, very surprising. And, and sort of connected to that, you know, I mean, how much do we... How much do we really know? How good is our sort of scientific understanding and the data on... Africa's main water sources, you know, where where they come from ultimately. Well, how much do we actually know? I mean, you know, the the one of the main focuses for the Royal Geographical Society for Livingston, Burton, Speak, mm -hmm. and all of these, um, we, we became world famous explorers for their time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're focused on finding the sources, and um, as we've found, the sources are not confirmed uh, in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, the work that we've done with Rolex on the Lungwe Vungu expedition uh, last year has demonstrated, and we're going through the scientific process now by measuring the flows on all of the other tributaries mm. to, to, to demonstrate this. But we, we're 99, well, we're 100% sure that the, the real source of the Zambezi is in Angola, not in Zambia. Um, that is by distance and by volume. Now, uh, you know, rivers have many sources, mm. all of which are important, mm. um, but this is the primary source, you know, um, based on its contribution to the river. And that's, that's, uh, that's rewriting history. Mm. That is um, um, very important for Angola, very mm. important for that water tower that we've been documenting mm -hmm. and exploring. Mm -hmm. um, also noting that, you know, these raised water towers, mm. these forested landscapes, yeah. are highly specialized because they're high rainfall, they're elevated, so they are typically heavily leached. So mm. the soils have nothing in them. Yeah. Uh, when you send uh, sand samples from that Angolan plateau yeah. to a lab, they will say that, no, you've washed this. Uh, there's nothing in this. So everything living up there is specialized. Every plant species, every tree, specialized to be there. Uh, we have now documented, um, discovered, 143 new species to science up there and conservatively i would say by 2026 we'll be well over 200. Uh, it's just sending scientists and every time they go they find something new mm. and i'm not talking about 143 new insect species i'm talking yeah. about across all taxa yeah. um you know from lizards snakes fish yeah. orchids uh, Trees, the whole thing. I mean, it is it is incredible. It's not four species of cricket that turned out to be five. That's yeah, no, 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 okay. no, 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 none of that. I mean, you're splitting them. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As they do. And, and and I mean, it's sort of fascinating to me, you know, hearing that the Zambi a river like the Zambezi has its source in Angola. It's in, you know, it's in, why does it why does it matter? Why why does finding out where the source of these where why does it matter to people and to the and to the, the wider environment? It's about the security of the upper reaches of that river system. Uh, without secure sources uh, that are stable and protected, mm. 
um, you're going to see these river systems become ephemeral. They're going to start to dry up. And um, that obviously results in the collapse of fisheries. Uh, it re results in uh, seasonal agriculture collapsing. Mm. Um, people not having access to water, human migration, yeah. big problems result from this. Yeah. Um, the sources of river systems, especially these ones uh, that we're exploring here, the Zambezi, yeah. these rivers need to reach up into the Congo Basin to that high tropical rainfall. Mm. And these sources and peatlands allow them to do that. Yeah. Um, so it's fundamentally so it's important. It's the stuff of life, isn't it? It's food, wa food, drinking water, power as well, I guess. Hydropower. Hydropower. I mean, you know, the Zambezi, we, what we can hear here, the, 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 that's the largest waterfall in the world. Uh, downstream, we've got the largest dam in the world, Kariba. Mm. Um, and the hydro schemes on the waterfall here and in Kariba, mm. these are failing uh, because of water flows, because of climate change. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to oscillate uh, more violently as we're seeing around the world yeah. uh, with the weather, uh, weather patterns. Okay, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, the Great Spine of Africa expeditions. Um, but first of all, what is the Great Spine of Africa? The Great Spine of Africa is these divides between the river systems. So now you follow the divides that really go around the Congo Basin. So you start in the, the Angolan water tower, uh, the Okavango Zambezi water tower is the largest representation of any such a structure in the world. Mm. It, is, it is vast and important. You have an archipelago of these things going around the uh, along the spine, along the divides between the Congo and the Zambezi, mm -hmm. the Congo and the Nile, mm -hmm. uh, the Congo and the Chad, mm -hmm. the Chad and the Niger. So you have this long arc. Yeah. Now that is associated with the Great Rift Valley system and the Great Lakes. So in Africa, you have the Great Rift, mm -hmm. the Great Lakes, and the Great Spine, all of which are fundamental to water flows uh, in Africa. Got you. And what is the aim of the expedition what are you, what expeditions what are you trying to achieve this is going to be the largest expeditionary mobilization in history uh, it's we're looking at 200 um, expeditions um by 2030 by the end of 2030 mm -hmm. um establishing detailed baselines for these rivers, ecological and hydrological baselines. That is the starting point. Uh, we are looking for conservation opportunities and then looking for conservation problems. But the team is focused this decade on opportunities. And the opportunities are in the upper reaches around the sources. Mm. These are typically unprotected. Mm -hmm. People there um, have little contact with the services of government. And we want to establish baselines with them mm look at protection, look at designation, things like the Ramsar we just discussed, yeah, yeah. Ramsar sites around those. And then go downstream. The further downstream you go, certainly when you go into the floodplain-based systems where the rivers are taking water out of, or the, the landscape is taking water out of the river, not putting yeah. it in like at the sources, that's where you're starting to find human settlement, agriculture, pollution, mm. conservation problems. Got you. Now, the conservation problems we'll address by doing repeat expeditions, repeating the baselines. A baseline is just a photograph of a river until you repeat it. Mm. Um, so it's opportunities and problems that we are going to find along the river systems of Africa, yeah. the great rivers. How, how did this come about? What's the sort of genesis for this? It is, like I said, um, the Okavango was my entire world. Yeah. Um, 2014, it became our planet's 1,000th UNESCO World Heritage Site, and that was a kind of snapped me out of it and I asked myself where did this water where does this water come from mm -mm. and a couple of months later we were in Angola uh, meeting governors and setting up these expeditions um, we discovered those sources up there all of these source lakes mm. and um, yeah it's just this progression now we're starting to look for more uh, we obviously grow as a project we, we start making films um, I become a National Geographic Explorer um, we establish our foundation mm. and we were able to to scale yeah. and to start to dream. And um, this is, I'm living the realization of, of a dream. You kind of, you don't, I never dreamt this, but you feel like you're living in one. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yes, it does sound and seem impossible, but it's not. Um, I meet people every week that um, I'm inspired by, I then bug them until they join the team. Uh, that's what we're doing here, uh, yeah. establishing new teams um, in Zimbabwe and Zambia yeah. around the Zambezi um, so that we can do our work here as quickly as we can. 
Yeah. Because uh, as soon as we have the baseline, we will find the opportunities and try and protect those landscapes, work with communities to better manage them, to make it sustainable, to create livelihoods. Yeah. And Thank you. <laughs> and when we find the problems, um, we repeat the baselines, engage yeah. with government, have symposiums and workshops, yeah. uh, create the information that governments need to shift pos policy if necessary, um, to move farms or think yeah. differently about dams. Yeah. Um, because you know, water is our future. Um, you know, Africa is becoming peaceful. Um, we're going to see a peaceful Africa that's going to develop rapidly. It's going. It's got a young population. We're going to see manufacturing and agriculture and all of these things come, and we need water for that. Uh, and we would love to hold on to our megafauna too. Yeah, so it's all. It's all very. It, it's funny. The thing that seems came out from there was that it's all very practical as well as the sort of academic interest that it came across. Um, I just wondered. Um, obviously, we were talking about peat, which is you know sort of massive store of carbon um and um you know we've been talking about rivers um what's the sort of role of these rivers and the land around them in terms of how africa does adapt and also how africa sort of helps mitigate a warming world you know what how what's can you sort of explain uh, you know how this all fits into the bigger picture of climate change i'm I, I'm, I'm quite frustrated by um you know carbon valuations carbon credits mm. uh, in africa um, it's become our responsibility um, to to help mitigate, to help offset. Um, carbon in Africa is very much undervalued mm. um, because of government changes and volatility, and and it's hard for for people to invest. Um, I'd like to see the markets evolve um, to the point where Africa is seeing value. I mm. mean, the the water tower in Angola we were talking about that is. 110,000 square kilometers of intact forest uh, and peatland in between the yeah. forest. I mean, that, that is a massive carbon sink. Yeah. It, it's worth trillions of dollars or pounds. Yeah. And it should be valued for that. And um, on the markets now, it wouldn't, it wouldn't gain that value. People would, would want to invest, but then play on futures and do all of the, those, those uh, investment mechanisms. Um, so it, Africa wants to play a role. Yeah. Um, more finance and investment needs to come uh, yeah. to, to protect these landscapes. Um, you know, you need additionality, you need threat to, to have carbon valued. Um, we don't necessarily have threat now in that vast mm. landscape, but it is sucking out carbon out of the, out of the sky. It is. Yeah. Um, it's about people's livelihoods as well, right? If, if, you, if people can't make a living from preserving those rich stores of carbon, they might consider exploiting it in other ways by turning it into a farm or turning it into something else. But, that, but that's the thing, the, 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 people, that the people living there are, are guardians of those forests. Right, okay. uh, they've managed them for thousands of years mm. uh, through fire. Yeah. Uh, if they didn't, then the, the fuel load would build up and the canopies would burn and the forests would burn down. Yeah. Um, it's our world reaching into this. Right. Um, it is, um, we saw in 2012, 13, 14, just before we arrive, uh, cheap gray import motorbikes arrive in Angola. Suddenly people from the city are coming on these motorbikes and hunting bushmeat. Suddenly around these villages, uh, animal populations start disappearing. Mm. That's our world reaching in. Mm. Uh, we are seeing the cities now reaching in as the roads that become more and more established into this landscape, they're starting to do the charcoal because they want charcoal for the cities. Um, but the people living there, uh, they are custodians, stewards, guardians mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. forests. Mm -hmm. And that's something we really need to protect. That is mm -hmm. a traditional knowledge and practice, culture, yeah. language. I mean, to me, certainly in Africa, um, the, the most important, most valuable, most endangered human resource is traditional knowledge. And that's rooted in culture and language. Yeah. And we're losing those every day that collective wisdom that gets passed down from yeah 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 um can i can i ask a little bit about you know you were saying about how you uh this is you can't obviously you need you need a baseline right because you obviously need to be yep. able to measure how things are getting better or worse from there what, what exactly are you collecting what data what sort of data are you recording just give us some examples everything <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, everything from uh, we'll have a 360 camera mounted onto uh, one of the boats, one mm. of the, the, the dugouts. Mm. That'll take a photograph every minute. That's of surrounding habitat. Mm. And within a few weeks after the expedition, we'll have that knitted together. And we basically create the Google Street Views uh, for the rivers we explore. 
So for all of the rivers we've explored, uh, you can go in there to a satellite image, you can see our route, you can dive in at any point and then look around, move forward, look around uh, as to where we were. Mm -hmm. We populate our data onto these systems. Uh, it's all of the, the birds that we see. It is all of the uh, people, human settlements, impacts. We are measuring water quality as we go down. Um, every 10 kilometers we establish uh, permanent monitoring sites, which are sites we can repeat in the future. Mm -hmm. And that is where we do detailed water quality mm -hmm. flows. Uh, we will send a drone up and do aerial uh, photographs mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of that area. On our kind of Google Street Views, it's called Earth Views. Mm. Um, we will let you know if there's an aerial, aerial photograph there to look at. Then you can, instead of the satellite image, we can, you can see a nice high resolution image mm -hmm. of that area. Mm -hmm. um, we do eDNA. Um, mm. We sample fish every single Explain day. Explain what eDNA is. No, I, you know, I was, I, I really, first we sample fish. Okay, yeah. so we set nets. Yeah. And we have sampled, you know, thousands and thousands of them. We, we don't kill the fish. We just take a small snipping of his fin and yep. uh, we look at the DNA. So now once we've got that, and we've got that for hundreds of species now, we can use environmental DNA. Now, fish, when they're swimming in the water, are shedding their DNA. And it lasts for about two weeks. So it's current data as to what fish are swimming in the water right there. And yep. then we'll take... Um, a couple liters of water and pump it through a filter and um, send that to the lab and through that water sample uh, they can pick up all of the fish species that are actually swimming in the water there so as opposed to catching them anymore we just take water samples as we go down yeah presumably you end up finding more stuff as well that way it's, it's less invasive i guess as well oh, it's, yeah. well like you then the, the nets are quite selective so right, i mean okay, yeah, yeah, sure. environmental dna we pick up everything so it's always surprising yeah, yeah. Like, well i did not know that was there yeah yeah okay and, and and I mean, it sounds like insane, almost insanely rigorous and and laborious. I mean, what some no, people might say it's like OTT. What's the you know why do you go why go to sort of such great lengths? Well, we 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 we're carrying hundreds of kilograms of gear in each of the boats. Um, I'd say you know the science is we have three priorities: it's uh, safety, science, and storytelling. Now the safety is just about a daily practice and briefings and 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 skills. Mm -hmm. The science absolutely essential, and that is that is our that's our daily work. The storytelling is is the the least practical. That is when you've got uh, giant battery systems, you've got all the computers, you've got cameras, drones, uh, reds, which is giant camera rigs. That's tough for us to take around. I mean. Um, and when you're tired at the end of the day and you've got someone pointing a camera at you and asking you questions, you're like, this is the last thing I want right now. <laughs> but it is so important I yeah. mean, to tell the stories, yeah. um, to translate the science. Yeah. Um, we, you know, every three or four years, we'll make a big film. We'll go to the big film festivals and really show the world. You yeah. know? And, and the people of Africa, the people in the countries we work, love that. They love yeah. the world to care. And to say, oh, well, that's important. Yeah. Um, but the majority of what we do is you know, inward facing. It is local language, um, communicating to the people in those landscapes, in those countries, uh, in, in those governments, yeah. to really show them the importance of what they have and explain it in a way that is you know, accessible to people. Just, just briefly, um, before, before I move on, I think just talking of that about local people, I think you've got a, a film coming out around, um, it's got one of your crew members in quite prominently. And, yes. And in Botswana, just, just briefly tell people about what, that's, what that is. That is our first Setswana language film. That's the language of Botswana. Um, it is called Inkashi. That is the pole that we push along. So it's you know what propels you forward in life. Uh, race for the Okavango. And now every year we have the Inkashi Classic. And now it is a boat race. We have time trials in all of the villages. And you know the top 60 elite polers uh, will come to the main classic. And then we have you know, a couple thousand people come and it's traditional food and music and it's really a festival. And um, the film's about that, uh, about three characters, their lives, um, you know, going on expedition with us um, and then taking part in, in the race. Uh, but it is, it's a powerful piece, it's local music, uh, locally composed. Um, it's never happened before, you know, you know it is, National Geographic quality. It's mm. made by National Geographic Society. It was a local film crew with the National Geographic film crew. Mm -hmm. It is just, 
you know, there are several points in, in the film where I cry. It's just because I can feel, obviously it's people I know very well. These are brothers and sisters to me, but it's, it's going to, in our, in our first film, Into the Okavanga, there are some sections where they speak Setswana. And when you play it in the local villages, that's when they light up. Mm. This whole film's in Setswana. It is going to, it is going to really light Botswana up. The boat, the boat race, where, where, is the, where exactly is the boat race held? In the Okavanga Delta. It's a, yeah, is, yeah, is it on a particular ri river or is it the particular? We do it on the Tamalakani, which is, right. uh, it's a fault line at the bottom of the Delta. Yeah. That's how the Delta forms, is fault lines. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's going through the main town, the closest town. It's okay. uh, Maun. That's yeah. kind of the, the launch site for all exploration and adventures into yeah. the Okavango. So the, the Tamalakani, um, how many is one river you've obviously been to? How many other rivers have you explored, would you say? I, 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 I can't offhand tell you. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, it's probably in the region of 12,000 kilometers, uh, probably 12. 13, 14 rivers. Mm -hmm. If you break down all of the, the the different names of rivers, it's in the 30s or 40s. I mean, you know, these are large river systems where the different countries name different sections, That's different it. tributaries. Yeah. We've done all of them. Uh, all of the channels in the delta are different names, and they're considered to rivers themselves. Go on, give me give me some examples of some of the ones you've been to. Yeah, I mean, or well, the Quito. The Quito was uh, 2015, launching the Source Lake. Uh, I learned I launched the boat backwards. Uh, we realized the source lake is blocked at its end, so we had to pull out. And then it's uh, 121 days, um, 2,476 kilometers. Um, you know, you are hyper fit, you've like, grown a beard, you've like, you know, homeless, uh, same clothes for all that time, um, capsizes with hippos, uh, tree blockages. Um, rapids uh i arrive in Maun at the end of this um actually we finished in the 400 kilometers past Maun in the in the desert in the mm. middle of the desert coming mm. from this tropical environment to the desert and we came back to Maun and we were celebrating mm. and uh, i had forgotten the pin numbers for all of my bank accounts for all the social media logins it was a complete reset I, 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 was, I was trying to pay at the hotel and I couldn't. I, 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 so I had to ask a friend, you've got to pay. I'm, I'm cut out from all of my... <laughs> You're probably but, disconnected. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, and then we, you know, we've done the Kubangu, another tributary that was uh, about 60 days, uh, fast flash flooding thing, uh, rocky based, like, you know, waterfalls and rapids mm. and uh, this highly dynamic, uh, very stressful, scary uh, experience, very different from the Quito, which was more kind of dodging hippos and slow moving, winding rivers. Mm. Uh, this river would go, it would, you would travel four kilometers to travel one in a straight line. You know, it's just winding upon itself. Mm. Um, the Kembu Kwandu, uh, these rivers are part of the Kwandu system going into the Chobe. Mm. These are rivers, you know, adjacent to the Okavango. They're mm -hmm. different, mm -hmm. connected to the Zambezi. Mm -hmm. Um, the Kembu had a crocodile bite onto the boat. And it's so, this crocodile is so big that it can carry a six-meter dugout canoe in its mouth calmly across the river and then just release it. It's like, you don't know what to do. It's like, ah, I'm just going to let it do that. I mean, the, the um, hippos uh, on the, on the Kwandu uh, had to... We made a film about this. We had to stop the expedition on the Zambian border um, because it was four interactions accidents yeah. with hippos in two days um hippos yeah it's like a hippo meditation i mean they they keep you focused on the water yeah um but i mean i'm yeah i, I just in the last week we learning about the zambezi a river yeah. this powerful and big um i've capsized twice this week i lost a boat <laughs> it's gone it's going to go over the falls at some point is that a first it's the first time. Yeah, we've managed. We've we've sunk boats and managed to dive them out and rescue them. Yeah. Um. But uh, this is a big deep river, this and, and, and lost. yeah. <laughs> I, last thing was it touched my foot and it was gone. <laughs> it was down. So, so this is obviously a huge endeavour. I mean, what give give people an idea of the sort of teams that make up these expeditions? You know, maybe maybe let's talk. Given we're here at the Zambezi, let's talk about you know how you find people, who they are. Well, I'm, I want to make the statement that that the the future of conservation in Africa is local. The future of conservation is local anywhere in the world now. And um, 
we would not have found one species, one source lake, uh, done any of this without people that live there. Um, you can't see the, the, the single track footpaths to these source lakes up in Angola from the sky with satellite. You can't figure this out with technology. Um, you cannot pull across the delta um, with a GPS. Uh, it's shifting and changing. It is a, it's a skill um, mm. to navigate that place and find your way and follow the water quite literally. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a traditional skill. Um, so that's what we're doing here. I was uh, in Zambia yesterday meeting the local fishermen mm. that are on the dugouts, uh, that are able to navigate these rapids easily themselves all the way up to Kazungulu and down, 150 kilometer stretch. So that's the focus. So obviously, we, we, the scientific teams come from around the world. Mm. Uh, we are facing a, a crisis around the world and in Africa. So we take that very seriously. And there is a human resource gap in Africa uh, for science. And we need to fill that for now. Yeah. Um, our um, foundation, our projects, uh, our partnerships, uh, we fund a lot of PhDs and master's students in these countries. Mm. We are building that capacity. Mm. We have local scientists join us on every expedition. Mm -hmm. But really the, the core of it is finding the guardians of the river, yeah. the local people, um, yeah. where, you know, that, that's generations. This is their life. This is their water. This is their river. Yeah. Um, they're the only ones that can keep you safe from the hippos, from the crocodiles. Um, this is not tourism. This, this is, there's no life jackets. Yeah. Um, this is um, traditional knowledge that keeps you safe. Yeah, it taps up to your previous point, obviously, of preserving that more at a wider level, obviously. Um, and um, you mentioned about sort of being hyper, ending up hyper fit on one trip. What, what are some of the sort of, give people a bit of an insight into some of the physical challenges on a sort of day to day on some, you know, you're heading out here on the Zambezi. What will be some of the physical challenges based on your past experiences? Well, it's you basically for months on end are running a marathon every day. Uh, it, it is um, we've done the most we've done is 65 kilometers in a day. Mm. Um, you have one or two people sitting in the front, and you know a few hundred kilograms of uh, of gear in the in the Makoro. You're sunk deep in the water, so you've got this much to play with on the hull, a tiny a couple of inches. Mm -hmm. um, it's very wobbly. Mm. Um, so your core is engaged the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, uh, then you're going through rapids. Uh, hippos are a constant threat. We have to stay in the shallows. Um, it's a, it's a meditative state. I mean, you, you have to be in the present moment, which mm -hmm. we in our, our city lives don't do that often. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you often see a person walking down the street with their headphones on, mm -hmm. they're not there. You know, you can you wave at them and then they snap out of it and they're in the present moment and they talk to you like mm -hmm. we are. We're present now, yeah. but often we're not. We're lost in abstraction. And uh, if you do that on the river, uh, it's, all, it's always something happens. Yeah. Something will happen. Uh, yeah. a, a, a capsize, a hippo, something. Yeah. Um, something that you didn't notice because you weren't present. And that mm. is, is a powerful thing. That is where... That's the source of human power, of, of living power, is yeah. the present moment. Which sounds like a lot of it's mental as opposed to a physical challenge. It's more mental. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, for the first 10 years, I was in agony getting off, off, off the Makoros, off our boats. I yeah. mean, like your feet and your hands, yeah. and you're just cramped all over, you hardly sleep. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not about strength, it's right. about skill. Uh, the more strokes I added each year, now, on a, on a long day, I'm not suffering. Um, it's strenuous. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's hot. It's yeah. you know, it is what it is when you're out there. But um, no, it's. Um, I think I've got another twenty years left in me, <laughs> yeah, uh, of expeditions. Yeah. Um, next seven years, I'm. I'm. You know, COVID really cut this decade you're short, what, didn't you're it? Forty three, forty four, forty four. Yeah, yeah, forty four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> COVID cut this decade short for us, uh, um, you know, for the whole world to hit 30 mm. by 30, you know, 30% mm. protected by 2030. Mm. It's become a lot harder. Mm. And a lot of our targets are for 2030. Mm. Um, being generous to ourselves, we've given ourselves to the end of 2030. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for the sort of Great Spine expeditions as a whole, how long, you know, how long is it going to take you to do all these rivers and all these, you know, all these catchments and get all the data? How long are you expecting it'll take? Look, it's um, 
It seems kind of Herculean. <laughs> I know that. Well, yeah, the project director told told me, um, and I was just recovering from um, uh, cancer, and so I'm like, you know, the world's kind of impossible for me at that time. And he says, we're doing. 50 expeditions in the next three years. I'm like, no, that's impossible. And, then, and, and my brain was still competing kind of, uh, when I was saying it was impossible, was 30 expeditions in five. And I was like, yeah, that's impossible. But now 50 in three, yes. Yeah, 105, 200 in eight. You know, like, no, we're going for 2030. Because uh, I believe that after 2030, um, the whole network of people that we've now connected with uh, through, the, through this exploration, through the science, mm. through the storytelling, we want to switch that to restoration and rehabilitation because th that's what the 2030s are about. Mm. That's what we're chasing for around the world. Is I, I'm, it's highly unlikely we're going to get to 30 by 30. Yeah. Um, but by 2030. 30 by 30, as in 30 percent of protected. Exactly. Sorry. Land, land and ocean. Yeah, yeah. And um, by 2030. But from 2030 to 2050, to 2050, it's about restoration, rehabilitation, because that's where the world is now. Mm. Um, we absolutely need to to switch into that investment. Clear. And what what sort of resources you need to do this? And um, I think Rolex is helping you. How are they helping? I mean, it's it's living a dream, uh, in a dream. Uh, Rolex have supported the the launch of this. I mm. mean, our, our first three expeditions into new basins, mm. um, uh, helping us elevate the importance of the Okavango Zambezi water tower. I mean, we're going to be in the coming weeks, flying over the Kasai, which is the source of the Congo in Angola. Again, like it's not recognized mm -hmm. properly. It is one of, I think, uh, Stanley, when he was going down, the famous explorer, when he was going down the Congo, he called it the big one. It was the big tributary coming in. And that's from Angola. Mm -hmm. And we get to explore that with, with Rolex's support. Um, and then go up and uh, you know, look at the Nile, the White Nile, and South mm -hmm. Sudan. And... Um, that is that is to me um, quite brave to support yeah. us in that because uh, we we are um, going into new territory and yeah. uh, I'm incredibly thankful. Great. And and obviously they they've they, I think they've got this um, perpetual planet initiative. What, why is that important not just to you but to sort of environment people you know working either. In conservation or research or you know other stuff elsewhere in terms of environmental science what what, what sort of role does that play elsewhere in the world do you, do you what's this what's your sense of that it's establishing a network of people that are doing this work everywhere um it is i mean you know when you feel recognized i'm not talking about being filmed or, or, or interviewed mm. um you really i remember my evolution where it was i became a national geographic explorer and they mm. told me think bigger think think broader mm. you know think outside the Okavango. i yeah. became a ted fellow think more now like with rolex it's just like yeah 200 in eight years and and and, and expand yeah and you see that in all of the rolex supported projects as part of perpetual planet is this kind of expansion in thought and scale and dreaming mm. um it is um it's a powerful mechanism for that, mm. to really amplify what people are thinking about and doing. Finding people that are doing something that's really working uh, in their specific place. Yeah. And really kind of creating an example that people will follow. People yeah. say, I want to be that person. I yeah. want to do what they're doing. Yeah. And I mean, the greatest achievement for us is to see people copying what we're doing, um, to aspire to it. We have people that come into our team that are just like, I'll do it for free, uh, I'll, anything. And it's a, they saw a Rolex video. They 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 saw that support. Mm. They saw that kind of this giant light shining on your work. You. Um, that's a powerful thing for around the world. A perpetual planet. Mm. And and you're a National Geographic explorer as well. What what does that? What does it mean to be that? And what does it mean to you? I mean, being a 21st century explorer. I mean, it, it's still a thing. I mean, there are there are species to be discovered. There are landscapes that are. Uh, scientifically unsurveyed. Mm. Um, look, I mean, I grew up with the magazine. Uh, it's a, it was a wonderful thing for the first time uh, to be called an explorer. And you know, I, I, I only really use it on when I'm flying uh, you know, internationally. And uh, the host, the host, kind of hostess comes along and says, oh, "I want to chat to you." And say, "Like, what do you do?" And I'm, 
I'm an explorer. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's that? But I mean, uh, no, it's um, National Geographic. Of, of uh, it's been my home for for ten years, yeah. uh, more than that now. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's helped me dream. Same as Rolex. Go ahead. And um, sort of shifting gears a bit, looking forward, I guess, somewhat. Um, from the data you've gathered to date, um, what are the sort of you, you you talk a lot about like practical outcomes and concrete things. What are some of the sort of I don't know policy changes or practical things you want to see check you know, ch- ch- happen to improve not just not just the natural environment but people's livelihoods in Africa as well. What are some of the things you want to achieve? Land rights, uh, heritage rights. Um, everywhere we go, you you find, you know, tourism is a way of funding conservation, okay, throughout Africa. And COVID really, really undermined that and made us think differently. Um, and the local people that were typically displaced from the parks uh, to create them mm. in, in the 1960s mm. and, and a bit earlier, um, they get jobs, you know, in the lodges and uh, as guides. Um, but they they don't have ownership. Mm. Um, people need to their heritage rights to land. Uh, you know they have familial history. Grandparents and fathers are buried on islands in the delta, or um, used to walk across these landscapes with their cattle and things. Yeah. Um, those rights need to be recognised. Mm. Uh, more shared ownership. Um, it's this kind of the less people coming in and doing things to people, as it were. Uh, no, we we need the best people in the world to come to Africa to help. Right, okay. we need that. Okay. We yeah. need that. I'm not saying that at all. So it's not like about an island mentality. No, like I just that. it's yeah. just the kind of you know sitting on the outside looking in. Uh, the fences, the fines, the guns. Mm. Um, people feeling excluded. Uh, feeling and there are more people outside of Africa that would lie, lie in front of a bus for an elephant than live in Africa. And that's a problem. Mm. Um, uh, there are children growing up throughout Africa that don't actually know what a lion looks like. Mm. Uh, they don't know what an elephant looks like. And we, do, and, and we need to change that. Mm. Um, otherwise, we are going to see a future where you know, there is no future for uh, elephants and lions and all the megafauna. Yeah. Um, on it, they're not going to go extinct. Uh, yeah. Modern society is going to keep them in some form in parks and things. But wilderness, yeah. like these you know, primordial places that really connect us with who we are, yeah. uh, those powerful experiences that we have in these yeah. wild places, we'll lose that. Yeah. And that, that we're going to lose before 2050. Yeah. Uh, that we're going to lose very soon if, if we don't um, shift and acknowledge traditional knowledge, heritage rights, land rights um, to people. And how to do that? You know, I don't know yet. Um, uh, it is something that we consulting is like a, people. Is there a sort of you know, saying about the importance of land rights? Is there like a particular country or a particular place in Africa that's like you know a bit of a sort of shining example on that, or you know, where is doing that well? Um, I think the greatest opportunity for it is in Angola because uh, you know 42 years of war. Um, it's kind of a, a, a blank slate. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the tribal structures are in place. Um, they're, they're very clear as to their land rights and mm-hmm. and, and and the areas they they're in. Um, but there's no shining example really oh, okay. um, in Africa as to this. It is Angola something. Could be one, hopefully, it could be, and I'd hope it is. Mm-hmm. I really, really, I, I really do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the upper reaches of these rivers, there'll be opportunities where, where yeah. people are living traditionally in unprotected landscapes mm-hmm. with the opportunity to remain there um, and live sustainably yeah. as the guardians of those systems, um, see benefit from the carbon markets. Mm-hmm. Uh, there should be water bonds uh, between mm-hmm. countries. Um, you know, it's we depend so much on that service, yeah. uh, you know, the clean water, fresh water, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, desalination is not going to save us. You know? Um, yeah. It, you know, that's the great gamble of our generation, the living generations today is we're starting to think that, okay, technology is going to save us. Uh, we're going to get all the carbon out using machines. And that's, that's not the case. Um, we, we, it's, it's, nature's going to do that. And um, one of our biggest opportunities to, to do that is Africa. Got on you. scale. Got you. And um, 
just on the sort of data you're collecting, you know, here at the Zambezi and on your some other your other expeditions, what are how you're sort of thinking really big picture? How do you hope that will sort of help preserve Africa? You know, you, we, you said there that you know it's just a second ago that you know we maybe better preserve individual species, but we might lose you know we might lose entire ecosystems. How might the de- sort of data you're collecting keep some of those ecosystems and some of the wildernesses? You know, how might how might that feed in? Well, like I said, um, you know, a baseline is just a baseline. It's a scientific paper in a publication. Uh, it tells you. It's like a photograph. It tells you how it is right now. Um, a baseline is worth something when you repeat it. And that's when we find a threat and a problem, uh, like we have found on the Kavangu with the nitrates. Uh, we're now repeating that baseline every two years. Uh, we're doing it this year. If we see an increase in those problems, we'll do it annually. And as we go down, we will start doing many repeats throughout Africa. Mm. Um, and that is, you know, we finish, uh, we fast track publication and our reporting. Uh, we will, within you know, three to six months, have a symposium with government and stakeholders and NGOs. Uh, we're scientists. We don't. We're not in politics or government. Mm. Uh, we simply, you know, objectively, will share the the scientific findings from empirical data and um, help the governments make uh, the right decisions Fair around um, agricultural development and whatever is causing that threat. Yeah. And, and if, if people are listening to this and thinking, I really like the sound of this, how can I help? How, how can they support the Great Spine of Africa expeditions? Is I mean, as more and more information becomes available from these expeditions, is, is go and find it. Um, learn about the Great Spine. Go find the spines on your own continents. Um, go down to the river uh, nearby and uh, sit by it and, and look mm-hmm. at that water and how important it is. Um, connect with it. Mm. Uh, it's uh, like I said. I mean, you know, Rolex helped us dream and think bigger and think about a great spine. Think about the great rivers of Africa. And I think everyone around the world needs to do the same. Um, there are spines on every continent. Um, some of them are quite easy to see: the Andes and the Himalayas. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's it's you know yeah you could, yeah you can I'd love it if if they made donations. That's yeah, we're yeah, quite sure. open to that. Yeah. The uh, financial support yeah. is absolutely necessary. Um, but you know, there'll be a lot of media and films and uh, articles coming out in this. Read yeah. them and share them, Got you. Um, and come to Africa. Uh, it we still depend on tourism, and it mm. is um, such an important way for. Yeah, I've guided thousands of people uh, in my life, um, and every single one of them have you know, you know felt something deep in their heart and uh, gone away wanting to come back. And I'd love for more and more people to have that experience. I know it's it's not accessible to everyone, yeah. but but come. Whether it's as a backpacker or to a thousand dollar a night lodge, mm. uh, please come. Great. I'm sure there's a lot of people who want to take you up on that invite. Um, and <laughs> it, just in sort of really you know really broad terms, are you? I mean, I think I'm thinking sort of beyond Africa here, but it's sort of like globally. How hopeful are you for the future? when it comes to the environment. And I guess I'm, I'm basically thinking everything here. I'm thinking for our ability to rein in climate change, to our ability to preserve and improve and restore the you know, ecosystems. How, where do you sit on the sort of pessimism, optimism scale? My children uh, connect me to the future. Um, so I have to imagine it, uh, what it's like. Um, I'm every day filled with hope. Um, Every day meeting people that are energized into into doing something in, in whatever context, whether it's as a lawyer um, or a shopkeeper or a conservationist researcher or an explorer. Um, I know we feel like our children are completely disconnected and they are on their iPads and there's no hope. Then they're, mm-hmm. they're not going to care. Um, it's not that. Um, we are becoming more sensitive to the world around us, to each other. Um, I know we think the world is this this mad place now. It's not. It really isn't. Uh, this is um, the best generation in history coming through now. Yes, the living generations now are the ones that caused the most damage, but we're also the ones that figured out how to fix it. And uh, it is up to our children to um, to implement all of this. And uh, they are more educated than us. Um, they are more connected than we are. Um, they know more. 
Um, they're not living in the dark. Their eyes are wide open. They're standing in the light. Mm. And um, I have great, great, great hope for the young people coming through. They're, um, they're our only hope. It's, it's not us. We're going to get the baselines. Uh, we are going to protect and conserve what we can. We are holding on for them. Mm. Um, but uh, it's, it's not over. Um, we, we are going to have those wild places in the future. We're going to have more. We're going to restore more. We're going to rehabilitate more. Technology is going to help us, but it's not the solution. Mm. Okay, that's a great note to finish on. Thank you so much, Steve.